in three, two, one. What's up, Jade? Thanks for coming on the show, man. Paul, good to see you, man. Thank you for having me, my friend. So you're in, uh, you're on the East Coast right now, hanging out your sisters. Yeah. But I was doing some research, and you spent some time over in the Seattle area. Yeah, six years in um, Kirkland, right on the border of Kirkland and Bellevue. If yeah. I remember correctly, I think it's five, the five ten bridge. The bridge uh, goes 520. across the water. Five twenty. Okay. So five twenty. If you take the five twenty across the bridge from downtown Los Angeles or downtown Seattle and yeah. get off at the first exit as you cross the water. I think it's the Bellevue Kirkland exit. Mm-hmm. Get off on that exit, make your first left. That's where I lived for six years in Seattle. So cool. What right were you doing? What were you doing in Seattle? I was uh, at Bastyr University there, uh, okay. naturopathic medical school. So that's where I went to study natural medicine. And okay. six, six years that program took, and then I went back east to North Carolina. And then I came back out west to Los Angeles. Different worlds, man. I don't know, but, but those of you listening and you, Paul, it's like, I actually really like the difference in perspective. There is something very interesting about just the energetics, both the people and the environment yes. East Coast versus West Coast. And then, of course, su- Southern West Coast versus the Northwest Coast. It's just, uh, and I love that. I'm one of these guys who just really um, is an, impacted by environments and different people. So I, I love that. I, I will say this. Seattle rain and all that kind of started getting. To <laughs> yeah, it's so. it getting to that point right now. But I I totally agree. Where within the United States, you almost have several little sub countries to where yeah. you just travel. And I always love traveling because it helps me get a better awareness as to like, oh, like there's different ways to go about life. There's different value systems and different ways to be successful or what is successful. You go to Colorado, yeah. totally changes versus when you're in New York. So. That's cool. You've been able to have kind of that that full spectrum. Of yeah, and Paul, you know your point there. I think is a, you know, I don't I don't want to let that point go by for the listeners because to me that point, the point Paul makes about the idea that having a different perspective and getting outside of your sort of current sort of zone of influence, I think is critical. And I think as what you know whether you're a, a coach or a practitioner or, no, or you know, someone who is trying to level up in any endeavor in life, that is the way we actually learn. It, you know, we, we humans are funny that way, right? Because we want comfort all the time. Comfort, comfort, stability. As a matter of fact, most of the work we're doing is to get comfortable. But being too comfortable and too stable is in itself very uncomfortable and also keeps you stagnant. And so we have to, in my mind, do that and expose ourselves to different things and so i have taken it to building that kind of stuff into my my lifestyle because i find if i don't um i might be productive but my brain just sort of gets stagnant and i oftentimes think about family members and people i know in my life that as they age they get more fearful they get more rigid in their belief systems and then when you look at them and really pay attention to what they're doing they don't do anything anymore they don't travel they don't read different books they watch the same you know, news channels, they read the same materials, they have the same friends, they eat at the same five restaurants. And then I just go, no wonder you're scared to death. And no wonder you can't take any change in life because you've stopped challenging yourself. Yeah, totally. It's almost the idea of, uh, you talk a lot about metabolic flexibility, but it just came to me where it's like cultural or societal flexibility, where you can be adaptive within different environments and relate to people. And I think the empathy thing is, is a big one as well that I try and talk about a lot. Um, so six years in Seattle, I want to kind of start there because I find it really interesting, your journey of how you grew up and how you kind of fused the background that your father gave you and the background that your mother gave you. I'll let you take it from here, but what was your background and how did it get you into becoming a doctor and to where you are now, um, with your current endeavors? Yeah, well, you know, it's, I, I love that you, you, you start there. Cause I think what's interesting for all of us humans is if we can understand our story and where we've come from. That gives us a lot of our signature strengths and a lot of our perspective, but I also think it gives us the direction, a little bit of the direction of where we're supposed to go to. So at least now when I look back, my father is relatively, was relatively conservative. Uh, his father was a small town doctor in, you know, a medical doctor in um, a town outside of New York City and was revered. That's back when, you know, family doctors did everything from, Mm -hmm. they dealt with, you know, he had stories about delivering babies and dealing with people who, somebody at a factory who had his 
leg severed in a an accident. So he did everything. He was the emergency room doctor, the pediatrician, the obstetrician, the everything, right? Yeah. He was revered. And I grew up hearing stories about that all the time. But they were also very conservative. My grandfather was had a great bedside manner with patients, his patients, but he wasn't very loving uh, in general with the family. So it's kind of one of those old school Italian yeah. in a sense. And my mom, exact opposite, sort of, you know, sort of this hippie kind of free love type of woman and just very liberal, very progressive, very like art, artistic in her, her way of thinking. My dad being sort of very logical and conservative and you got to take care of business and do what works. And so these two things I think impacted me pretty um, dramatically and then sent me down a path add in brothers and sisters I'm the youngest who are were very athletic and also very you know driven and very good at school and I got involved with athletics um, and you know there's two ways you can go it's interesting right as a younger kid I could either have followed in my my um, my siblings footsteps or I could rebel and for a long period I rebelled and just did not want to do anything I didn't want to do good in school I didn't want to do any of that kind of stuff but I did love athletics. And this is what's interesting, I think, about passions, right? Passions can get you in trouble because if you chase passions too much, they can have you bouncing all over the place. Oh, I like that. Oh, no, maybe I'll do this. Oh, we all know people like that who can, they have all these passions and can't settle on one thing. But I found this groove. Sometimes you find a groove of passions that leads you to purpose. Yeah. I found that sort of early on. First, a love of football, which turned into a love of fitness, which turned into a love of nutrition and biochemistry, which then turned into a love of medicine. Now, of course, my mother and father, my dad having the sort of logical sort of, you know, hard work sort of uh, uh, medicine in his background, and my mom sort of being this you know, open, you know, free loving, you know, uh, sort of progressive mindset, I really, you know, sort of found without even realizing that I, I followed those two paths. One, I, I tend to be a very analytical, logical guy, if you talk to me, but I also tend to have a little bit of woo in me. Mm-hmm. And it's par- partly why I went to, you know, the, the natural medicine side of things instead of following the traditional route. So I'm a bit of a a renegade in that regard. And I think that also is why, uh, you know, you know, I don't know about you, Paul, but one of the things I find interesting is why does anyone even care what I think or do? I find it interesting and like, I'm flattered about it. Like why? And then I wonder, you know, you too probably feel the same way. It's like once you have a platform online, people seem to care, which has always surprised me. But I think if anything, um, if anything makes me interesting, it's simply the fact that I, I do think outside the box. I, I, I don't just repeat um, what I hear people saying. I actually am very interested in getting down to a deep understanding and then very passionate about teaching that. And to teach that, then you have to you know, kind of become a, a better communicator, right? And so all of that sort of led me to sort of where I am now, which is you know, health, fitness, specialty in metabolism. Weirdly enough, a specialty in female metabolism. And then a deep sort of understanding in psychology and philosophy. And um, that's sort of been, uh, you know, my background and how I got to where I got to. So now, surprisingly enough, I get to write books in, on metabolism and, and personal development. And, uh, you know, I tend to span both of those worlds. This is why I have a moniker. I didn't give it to myself, but I thought it was funny. At first, it kind of bothered me, but I, someone called me a meathead philosopher. And at yeah. first, I was like, <laughs> at first, someone gives you a moniker like that, and you're just like, what? You know, like, it kind of bothered me at first, but then I was just like, yeah, you know what? That actually fits. You know, I'm a guy who's heavily into health and fitness, and, um, but I'm also, you know, deeply into, uh, you know, logic and education and learning. So I think that, that fits in a way. Yeah, and I think that's that dynamic ability to go and relate to someone who's like, yeah, man, like, let's go do supersets on the bench. And then you're like, yeah, let's do that. And then like you tell someone about this stoicism book that you're reading, but then you also can go have this conversation with other people and be like, Hey man, like, have you ever thought about like, going to the gym? And like, Jim, what do you mean? It's like, dude, this is sick. Like, let me open this world to you. Yeah. And so that's one of the things I love about your background and what you do specifically like the psychology piece. Cause you, you do so much coaching and you, in medicine, you talk about, you know, getting people to change their lifestyles, but that's so hard to do because what you talk about 
with your background and your family, that really kind of sets the foundation to where then people have to go figure out life on their own, but they're always going to have the stories from their family or the background or the trauma or whatever. How has that background in psychology and your deep dive into that kind of transformed what you do from a coaching standpoint? Because there's the X's and O's. Mm -hmm. That stuff's easy. Yeah. It's getting people to change stories that I find the hardest. Yeah, I mean, honestly, I mean, I can tell you're coming from a, a place of wisdom here is why you're asking the question, I'm sure, because I, I discovered sort of early on that to get a little bit, you know, sort of esoteric now, just to, it, for a minute, I, I, I can answer this question. Here's one thing I know. I know this about you, Paul. You know it about me. I know it about every single person listening to you and I have this conversation. You are in deep pain. You are in deep suffering. You have deep hurt. You have wounds. You have a unique set of circumstances that sucks because that's what human being human is about. As a matter of fact, Buddhism talks about the idea that life is dukkha, which essentially says life is suffering. And right. the whole idea behind philosophies like Buddhism and Taoism is the idea of how do we deal with suffering? Well, you can fight against it. You can blame, you can complain, you can act as a victim or you can kind of go with the flow. You know, in the yin and yang, most people know that imagery, that's a Taoist imagery. Well, the most important part of that image is the line that runs between the black and white. And that is the, what the Taoists call the way. And the way means flowing with, loving what is, right? Mm. And so to me, I go like this, the whole entire reason people stress and want to get better with nutrition or with diet and exercise and these things. And the whole reason they fail oftentimes is because their pain and their suffering sabotages them because they don't know how to integrate that stuff into, you know, to use a cliche term, a purpose-driven life. Once you get in alignment with what you're doing here and how to integrate your pain and your suffering, which we can talk about, all of a sudden you can tie these outside things to it. For example, I'm very clear now in my life that my unique signature strengths, knowledge, suffering, pain has made me uniquely suited to teach in the realms of health and fitness and personal development. My passions, those are my passions, but my purpose is teaching. Like this is why I'm on the planet, I believe. Not because somebody told me, not because Paul, you told me, because I decided right. I'm going to be a teacher. And then I go, well, that means that I have to, if I'm going to teach, especially in this realm, even if I wasn't in this realm, nutrition becomes important because I need to have the energy and the nutrition to teach. It also becomes important because I need to look the part to the best of my ability. Fitness also does the same thing, allows me to be fit and strong and have stamina and do the work that I need to do. If I tie those two things to my ability to teach and make a difference in the world, I'm much more likely to do them when uh, no one's watching, right? When I don't have, you know, uh, any kind of outside sort of um, uh, motivations. Like, here's an example. I'm 45, right? So bear, bear with me here, but I think you guys will find this funny. I'm the ugliest I've ever been. I'm the fattest I've ever been, <laughs> right? I am, I am no longer this young you know, dude, I never was a great looking guy to begin with or someone that judged that. But when I was young, a lot of what I was doing was like, well, I want Paul and other people to see my abs and see me being fit. And I want to win the, the war. And I want to, then you get older and you're just like, look, my face is falling off. I don't feel as good as I used to. My looks don't matter from a cultural level perspective anymore. What am I here doing? Right. Well, I'm here to teach. I'm here to make a difference. Then, okay. Now, how does health and fitness tie into that? How does nutrition tie into that? Because if my goal and my only reason for doing what I'm doing is culturally motivated and status oriented, like I just want to look good for you. So when you see me, that falls apart when life gets hard, right? And right. so I guess what I'm saying is the way that we integrate this stuff is we take our signature strengths, our unique life lessons, which, by the way, our most important life lessons come out of our unique suffering. I know each, everyone listening has that. And out of that comes a choice to be a thing, to choose your purpose. You don't, it doesn't, you don't find your purpose. You create your purpose. 
Sometimes you can create it out of following the path of passions, which I did, right? right? But I chose my purpose. And then from that purpose, now I can say, here's how health and fitness, going to the gym every day, eating good, having positive relationships, managing my finances. Here's how it fits into my purpose. That to me is what most people are missing in their ability to stay motivated as they age. I mean, I don't know how old you are, man, but um, I think- An you, old 28, an old okay, 28. Okay, so yeah, so it's a, great, it's a great age because where you're at, right, you're still probably in that sort of phase of like, yeah, I mean, I know I want to look good. Then maybe you're married or you got married or you're in a relationship and you're just like, okay, well, that becomes less of a motivator because I have this romantic partner that I want. And then you have kids and other things start to, you know, uh, compound, you get a job and you start focusing on the other things and the motivations, the status oriented motivations that you had when you were younger, the high school sort of mentality start to dissipate. And then that's what happens by the way, as everyone ages, this, that's the major reason why you see people in their forties and fifties who aren't very fit kind of like, how did that happen to them? What actually happened? Well, I'll tell you what happened. Their thirties and their forties happened and life happened and pain happened and issues came up and all kinds of things began to show you that st uh, stressing and being uh, obsessed about diet and exercise, there's more to life than that. Right. And so in order to keep doing that, you have to tie it to a deeper purpose. And that's to me what most coaching comes down to like when you and I ultimately sit down, like you said, the X's and O's, we can certainly take somebody and say, here's what to do. And I guarantee you, if we have a 22 year old male or female that you and I are coaching, who's fresh out of college and single, they're going to do what we tell them to do. Mm -hmm. They're, they're, they're going to be pretty motivated, especially if they show up. However, we have a mother or father who's 35, 36, and who's been through some life and has other priorities, it's going to be much more difficult. And so we're going to have trouble getting them focused. And the way we get them focused is to get them purpose driven to help them understand why are you even doing this? Because, you know, nice abs aren't going to do it anymore. At 35 and 45, my age, I could care. Like, what, what do I think people are going to say about me when I die? You know, I love JD had the best abs <laughs> in the world. He, he, he was, he had, you know, you know, a chiseled jawline and the best abs and a great tan. Ooh, yeah. Oh, he had a great, he had a whole bunch of money and a, and a cool sports car. No, that's not what we're going to say. We're going to be like, I love that dude because he made a difference. He helped change the way I saw the world. He made my world better in some way. And I want to celebrate him for that. More importantly, take the ego out of it. At the end of our lives, when we're on our deathbeds, can we say to ourselves, you know what? That was a, a life worth living. That was a fun game to play. And I, I think I made a difference. Yeah, totally. I think one of the really cool things you touched on was just how when we're attached to things and everything ends, everything dies, everything fades, but we attach to our bodies or we attach to a relationship or a situation. And because we're so comfortable and we don't want to have to either evolve with it or beyond it. And I find that type of suffering super interesting. And a lot of, I feel like whether it's yoga or Taoism, a lot of in, different philosophies talk about not being attached to things because everything fleets. Right. And when you're no longer attached to things, then you're able to kind of like flow with. And I don't know, to that point, the idea of, of suffering and having your purpose driven behind it. I love the, the, how the Latin of passion is to suffer. And yeah. so when you kind of look at those three things where it's like passion, suffering, and purpose, all right, I'm, this causes me to suffer. Now I'm passionate about it. This is my purpose. And to your point, sometimes you chase those passions. Like I love skateboarding. I'm just going to skateboard because it's my passion. But for me, it's like I suffered. I don't want others to suffer. And so that, I feel like that's another way to find that purpose. Dude, that is so well said. I love the way you said that. So I'm going to, I'll steal that whole thing about passion, suffering, purpose. And actually, I'll, I'll, I, I just, I don't know why when you were talking about water, this kind of pops into my head. Think about this. This is how most people do life. Imagine you're, imagine you and I are surfers, right? And we go out into the waves one day and we hit, dude, we hit the best set ever, oh, right? It's like 
wave after wave and we're just like oh my god this is so beautiful and wonderful and we come off the water and we're just like what an amazing experience and then the next day we come back and because it's the wet water is different that set will never appear again in the way it, it came mm. because things are different we complain and we blame and we're like it's not like it was why isn't it what's wrong we start slapping the water we start complaining we start yelling at the lifeguard we start yelling at each other right we start complaining about the fact that this set of waves is not like it was and this is very important because this is what people do with their lives they get into a romantic relationship it ends they for whatever reason and then they lament not just for a year or two years or five years or six years they're crying and complaining and blaming and destroyed because that set of waves never came back the way it was. It's not meant to. Life right. is nothing if not change. Our whole thing is you take those sets, you see the beauty, you ride them when you're there, and then you realize that the whole goal of life, the whole game of life is change. And so then you go out and you ride the next set. And by the way, maybe you get a couple great sets on the water, but then one day you're going to get tossed around. You're going to oh, get yeah. beat up. You know, a shark's going to come and bite you or something, or something is going to happen where it makes you question what you're doing out there. And by the way, when that happens, you have two places to go. You can go, I am going to learn from that and get better, or I'm going to become degraded by that. Now, when we're young, if you're a young surfer, what are, what are we told or what do we think? I'm going to get back out there and conquer the wave. When we get old, though, we go, that's getting uncomfortable. So I don't want to go back out on the water, right? Yeah, I, don't I, wanna, I don't want to learn the lesson. And I'm not saying you have to. I'm saying be aware of your choices, though, because that's what we're doing sort of again and again. But I can guarantee you this to drive it, to drive it home. If something meaningful is attached to you riding the waves and suffering through that, even if you suck, you'll show up every day and do it. If, yeah. it's, if it's meaningful and purposeful for you, whether it's you know, uh, making a difference in the world or whether it's taking care of your family or whether it's um, showing up in any way, if it is meaningful for you and you decide that's what you're gonna do and it, it really hits you in your heart, you'll show up and suffer for that. And so in the end, I guess the end result of this, com this part of this conversation is for me, is that that is the key to suffering. And that is the key to making progress, is to decide and choose what you will suffer for. Because life is going to be messy, period. This stuff is not going to be easy, right? It, the, the, my whole thing with life is that easy is earned, and people don't understand that. They want it to be easy right from the get-go. So whether we're talking about health and fitness, whether we're talking about personal relationships, whether we're talking about finance, and, and I see it as four jobs we have, right? We right. all have to do those four jobs, health and fitness, finance, personal relationships, purpose, and meaning. My whole thing is that ultimately you decide what you're going to suffer for. And then the suffering is no longer suffering in a sense. It still might suck, but there's a purpose behind it. Yeah. It's, it's being able to sit next to stress or sit next to suffering and be like, what's up? Like, you're not going anywhere, but we're, we're in this together. And yep. to what you talked about earlier, like, why do people look up to us or listen to what you say, for example, I feel like because people want to be on the shore, they want to listen to someone who the people that have the most influence are usually the people that have suffered the most and learned the most and grown the most. So they're like, Hey man, I don't want to suffer, but it looks like you have like, tell me what you learned out there on the waves. Yeah. Um, and you know, what's beautiful about that too, is I think that, uh, in the end, you know, what this is Adlerian psychology, by the way. So I don't know, Freud, there's Freud, Every, everyone knows Freud. Most people know Carl Jung. Most people don't know Adler. Those three are sort of the giants of psychology. And in Adlerian psychology, he's my favorite because to me, he's the one that made the most sense. Freud was kind of a nut and Jung. They had some great things to say, but science has proven a lot of what they, a lot they of have Freud, shown. Yeah. But Adler to me seemed to have it correct. And essentially what he said is that most people in life want to establish vertical hierarchies, meaning that we want to have our status equal to or above other people. And this is why you have base level human types wanting to push each other down. Maybe they'll want to pull you up to where they are, but they don't typically like it if you pass them. And that vertical hierarchy creates lots of stress and suffering in our minds. Instead, we need to turn it and go, 
look at horizontal hierarchies, right? So yes, if me and you are great surfers, there are gonna be some people on the shore watching us and wanting to learn from us, right? As spectators. However, if we go out to the soccer field and we don't play soccer, we then get to be spectators there and learn from them. And so I think one of the first things to understand about being human is that there is some place in this world that you are uniquely suited for and a unique expert in and that you teaching that enhances the world and makes a difference for me yeah. and Paul. You are listening to Paul and I talk right now because on some level you're now like to use your analogy, you're in the stands watching us and learning from our experience. However, I think when you get purpose driven and get purpose focused, you start asking the question, how can I show up and make a difference? Even if it's in the same realm as Paul and Jade, for example, you and I know, man, like we, we can have this conversation and some people will listen to this and be like, I love those two dudes, man. I just love, totally get it, totally vibing with them. Someone else would need somebody else to say the exact same thing. Yes, I but love in, that. in a slightly different way, and then they get it. And so I love that idea too, right? Because you and I could be teaching the exact same stuff, but just by virtue of me being a big, bald-headed, weird, you know, uh, accent guy, some people will love that about me. Some people would rather hear it from Paul. And so I, I think that's the hor horizontal hierarchy idea, that we each have something to teach and a unique way to contribute. And our job is to find that. Yeah. I like the analogy of like video games. I don't know if you ever play video games, but some people are mages and some people are tanks and some people have this skill set, but then they have weakness in other ones. And then it's vice versa for other things. So when you talk about soccer, I am terrible at soccer. I love soccer, but I'm definitely a spectator. And so I just know that certain people I vibed with because I identified to the same values, the same things that they were about. They had a similar story. But to what you're talking about, we all have unique experiences. And so we all have this unique identity to where someone can be like, oh, like I had the exact same thing happen to me. I'm going to listen to what they said versus if you say it and they don't have the same story. They're like, ah, that doesn't relate to me, even yeah. though it does. Yeah, and, that, and you know, it's interesting for that. Think about just marketing, right? Any of you who are, who are listening, who are entrepreneurs, especially in the health and fitness space, think about what has happened in the, the you know, sort of age of social media. What's happening is we are all presenting our stories in this story, sort of storyboard platform. It's like, it's like we all have our own reality TV shows now. Yeah. And as we market, we niche. So we are pulling in people who are similar to us in a sense. And we do it on two levels. One, we do it based on our expertise. And two, we do it based on our personality. So I find this interesting, but my expertise um, is, well, the expertise I'm most known for is female metabolism, right? So I have a lot of females who follow me, which I find bizarre because I'm just like, well, look at me. It's like, I'm, I'm definitely not, uh, you know, someone who you want to be like, but I am someone who has information you want to learn from. Right. But then I also have, if you look at my breakdown of followers, I have younger males. Typically, I have women between the ages of 45 and 65 that follow me. And I have men between the ages of 18 and 35 who follow me. And it's because it sp spans these two things. They want, the guys want to hear my philosophy and training advice. Mm -hmm. the women want to hear my expertise in sort of educational, uh, medical sort of advice. The beautiful thing about that is that it means we all have a space um, and platform to teach in. All yeah. we have to do then is just to decide, right? And there's another aspect of that because if you and I decide that we're going to be, let's say, you know, the expert in andropause, male menopause, basically, um, we need to continue learning and growing and, you know, educating ourselves to become an expert. We can't just decide that we're an expert. We also have to then begin to live that expertise. And that's where a lot of people will fall down in business because they'll go, I'm interested in that. I know a little bit. I read a book. I'm going to become an expert, which I'm like, good for you. Just get in there. Just start doing it. But at that point, what separates the real experts from the, the non-experts is the people who eventually stop reading and studying everything that's like in the blogs and podcasts and stuff like that and start 
actually getting certified or going to read research or more importantly, having their own unique thought processes around yeah. it, which is what's cool about you doing a podcast. And I do one too, is because we get to have a unique platform to deliver education to people. Yeah. What have you found that helps you essentially they always, people always say you want to be an expert in one thing. But when you have kind of two or three Venn diagrams to your skill set, you now have to be an expert in multiple things to fuse them all together. How do you make sure that you are essentially being still educated and still knowledgeable? Obviously, it takes time, but how do you kind of balance the two or three worlds that you try and live in? Well, if I was going to, you know, I do some business coaching and stuff like that as well. And if I was going to um, educate or give advice to anyone who has the same kind of background that I have, you know, it's sort of like Jade is 25 years personal trainer. So there's the fitness physical aspect of that. He's also biochemist, natural medicine guy. So there's the metabolism piece. He's also philosopher, psychology guy. In the end, if you want to start a business, you have to settle on one, in my opinion. So you focus on one from the business perspective. So for me, what happened was my first business was a boot camp. I, tailored the, the sort of, um, you know, physical aspects of what I did. I then branched out into um, metabolism type stuff. And now you're seeing me on my third iteration that I've sl I'm slowly bringing in the personal development. I don't think you can do all at one. Some people can, but I think that makes it harder. I think you need to sort of focus on it. So that's the first answer for people who are just starting. The answer to where I am now is essentially um, I have my bread and butter from a business point of view. It still tends to be in workouts. So most of my money, believe it or not, is made through building workouts that are sold online through my publisher. And, you know, sort of um, the metabolism programs that I do as well. I don't make much money on self-development yet. I just started doing events in that, uh, you know, sort of that genre. But if you follow me in my marketing platforms, which is another word of saying my social media platforms. Because yeah. I personally wouldn't be on social media probably if it weren't for the fact that it's a business. But if you follow me there, you will see that I purposely spread these things around. One minute you'll get nutrition, metabolic type advice. Another minute you might see some meathead shirtless photos and a workout pose. The, another minute you might see a very deep thought provoking sort of self-development, personal development sort of post and I sort of spread that stuff around. It's still mostly metabolism because I know that, I, that that is sort of um, where my bread and butter is from a business perspective. I can't uh, you know, go too far past that. But what I've slowly done is integrate that more fully. So now at yeah. you know, 45, you can say, oh, Jade, I know Jade Tita. He's, he's that doctor that does, you know, he's an expert in metabolism. He used to be a personal trainer. And dude is like always talking personal development. I follow him, blah, blah, blah. And maybe I, I now I have people who bought programs for me in all those arenas. I see people who like took some of my professional courses. I, I train trainers and train nutritionists and doctors. And I've seen them that those same people who will be at my next level metabolism event posting out of my book, Human 365, which is a personal development thing and doing Metabolic 10, which is a workout program. Yeah. And so to me, slowly I started to build those. And to me, it's also about having a platform that allows you to showcase that. Like one of the great things about this man is like you and I getting face to face, having this conversation, people get to say, oh, I love that dude, Paul, because I know part of his story. I know some of his expertise and I get a, a, a sense of all of who he is. Now, if you don't have a podcast, then maybe the thing is you get a sense of me. Like if you really want my personality and some of my goofiness and stuff like that, you'll find it show up in some of my stories sometimes yeah. on Facebook and Instagram. If you want my expertise, it kind of shows up in my feed. And if you want some of the deep education, it kind of shows up in my podcast. So I think it's very clearly a strategy that, uh, that has to work. Uh, that's, you know, uh, that you have to sit down and actually go, where am I going to start? Where's my focus? Because to me, I have this other saying that easy as earned is one thing that I live by. Another one is if you're not focused, you're fucked. You have to be focused <laughs> on one thing first. Get that going and then you can grow from there. Yeah. And then develop a strategy around that. Yeah.
No, it makes a ton of sense. You've mentioned a lot about the metabolism and I want to jump into that next because I know that that's your bread and butter, but you also previously mentioned kind of the four human jobs, yeah. um, finance, fitness, relationships, and then purpose. Can you go a little bit into detail on that? And then there's some questions within that, that I think I'm really interested in, but I also know listeners will be interested in as well. Yeah, this is, this goes into, so from the business discussion we were just having, one of the things I, again, it goes to purpose, right? Cause I was like, what is, what am I uniquely suited to teach? Well, I have this personal development psychology background that I haven't brought for, forth yet. And I haven't, what the hit I got was there's a lot of people talking about things that I have a different take on and I'm going to start putting that stuff out there. People start responding to it. Right. And so one of the things that I have done over the last 20 some years is I put together this, what I call the next level human construct. What is a next level human? In, in a very short way of thinking, it's a person who prioritizes personal growth for the betterment of team human, basically. So rather than trying to win, you know, um, that would be a base level human. I just want to beat you and be better than you versus trying to fit in. That would be a cultural level human uh, status oriented. I actually want to grow as a human. That's what I believe I'm here for. And in that growth, hopefully make the world a better place. That's a next level human. Now that journey is a separate journey, but each of us humans within that journey have to do, we, if we're living today, we have to do four things. Whether we learn about it or not, whether we like it or not, we have to do four things. We have to earn a living, which typically means finance for most people. But even if you're out living on the street, you still got to find a way, a place to sleep, things to eat. You have to earn a living. Mm -hmm. We must, you know, uh, earn, manage, save money. That's the first job. After that, we need to keep our bodies healthy. We need to attain and maintain health and fitness. If we get sick, uh, we're not going to be able to do anything and we won't last long on this planet. After that, we have to manage personal relationships, right? Our romantic relationships, our family relationships, our peer relationships, our coworker relationships. We are uh, community oriented animals above all else. We're all about connection. So we must do that. And finally, if, and you can almost look at these as, you know, sort of a Maslow's hierarchy of needs in a sense, right? The final thing is, at that point, we feel a unique drive. Every single one of us humans believes. We are very much in touch with this when we're a kid. We believe we're here for a reason. It's the reason when we're kids, we play it like we're superheroes and this and that. Like, yeah. we think that we uniquely are suited to do something. We have a drive to make a difference. That's where purpose and meaning sort of comes from. So from my perspective, these four jobs are jobs that every human has to do. And I have a theory, Paul. The way I look at it, man, is I go, when you evaluate me, when you see me, when I meet you, when we talk to the people who are listening to us right now, whether it's a romantic type of thing, whether it's a friendship thing, a peer-to-peer -peer thing like you and me, we are evaluating how well they're doing those four jobs. That's literally how we decide, do we respect this person? Are they worthy of someone mm. to sort of um, pay attention to? And so these things are going on behind the scenes all the time. What's, un what's interesting about that too is that if you look at internet business, isn't it interesting that those four things are the four things that make the most money online? People yeah. who teach about money, people who teach about health and fitness, people who teach about personal relationships, and people who teach about personal development. Those are all the areas you make in the info product space. The and four they also biggest happen problems. To be the core four jobs that every human has to do. Yeah. So hopefully that explains it. And I guess my whole thing is the degree to which we're doing those four jobs well is the degree to which we feel fulfilled and we can actually live out you know, our best next level human tendencies. The degree to which we are failing at those jobs is a degree that we become more base level or culture level in our way of approaching the world. When we're judging someone off of how well they're doing that at a subconscious level, is that a frequency thing? And I always say like, and a lot of people, you want to compete against yourself. So is it, are people judging you off of what they see as execution of those next four levels? Or is it a vibration to where like, wow, this person is crushing it with what they have? Yeah, it's such a great question, right? Because I, I look at it like, you know, very simply, we have mirror neurons. I can look at you and kind of pick up on sort of the way you're feeling. Well, we also sort of have this sort of like wishful neurons in a sense. We go, how am I doing? How are they doing? And then yeah. and we compare. Now, a lot of people would say, well, you shouldn't do that. It should only be with you. And I would say, 
Yes, definitely keep it with you. However, it's useful. This is the whole point. People are practice and people help you see aspects of your blind spot that you can't see. So you do want to pay attention to uh, individuals and how well they're doing because they will have clues for you. They're almost laying breadcrumbs for you to do better jobs in certain areas. Like think about it. If like one of the things that happens with me is I earn really, really well now. And I always like to be honest with this because the internet space is filled with people being like, we're multimillionaires and blah, blah, blah. I earn really well. I have historically struggled with saving and managing. So if I wanted to get better at that, let's say you're great at that. I need to recognize that in you and be like, um, Paul is someone I need to learn from because he's yeah. figured out how to invest and how to manage real estate and how to do some of the things that I'm an amateur at. Right. So that's where that's where the understanding of horizontal hierarchies comes in, because then I go, it's not about me going, I'm trying to be better than that's why it's called next level human and not, you know, higher level human. It's just basically saying on my field where I've chosen to play, if I'm on the football field, is there something that I can learn from the position? You're wide receiver, let's say, and I'm linebacker. Can I learn from the way Paul is playing? He's yeah. excelling there. I can see how he's excelling. I can learn from him. And that's important to recognize. It. It's also very important to recognize in this time of social media and stuff like that is to not go too down into that comparison trap because you have a unique story, a unique upbringing, a unique set of circumstances that um, may or may not give you advantages. By the way, I do too. That's how come I'm a little bit like this with you know, the whole equality type discussions that we have out in politics. Because I go, as a white male, to me, I go, it's, uh, it's uh, self-evident that I have had uh, you know, um, advantages that, for example, I grew up in a lower middle class sort of environment. So I saw, and I grew up in the South. So I saw the differences between, let's say, me, a white male, and my black male friends and some of the struggles they had. However, they also had, and we also have to go, we all have weaknesses and struggles and we all have strengths and struggles and the degree to which we can own those things about ourselves mm -hmm. and turn it to our good is all that really matters in the world. And by the way, that's to me what a next level human is. It's about, I'm going to do the best with my dysfunctions and my strengths. And once I have my own oxygen mask on and I've got my own life in order, then I can turn around and begin to help other people do the best with their life circumstances and put their psychological oxygen mask on. And from there, that's how we get better. At least that's the way I see it. Yeah. It's, it's the life isn't happening to you. It's happening for you. And you have to essentially decide how you're going to respond to those situations. One, I, I love, that's one of those cliche statements that I love, right? Yeah. It's like one of those things that it's one that I go, I oftentimes have plenty that I'm like, I don't know if I agree with that, but that one I do. I do think that mindset of life is happening for me is powerful. Yeah. And it, I think to that point too, people are always like, oh, be more positive. And I, I forget if it was your podcast or someone, but uh, this doctor was saying 75% of the thoughts we have are negative. So we have to do a lot of work to be positive. But in every situation, there is stuff that is really shitty. And there is stuff that is incredible, whether it's a relationship, the job that you have, and wherever you focus is what is going to grow and manifest. And so I think to that point, it's just being able to say like, all right, what do I have? People get injured and they're like, my leg's broken. I can't work out. It's like, homie, you still got the entire upper part of your body. You got isometrics. You can do so many things. But if you take the mindset of my leg's broken, I can't work out, then you're right. You can't work out. Yeah, I, lo I love that thought. It's funny. I um. A lot of people don't know this about me because I'm in the metabolism space, but I've struggled with metabolism based stuff. My blood sugars tend to be pretty high. I tend to be sometimes if I'm not watching my diet, I tend to be pre-diabetic. You know, my blood sugars will be really high. And here's what happens. There's two ways I can go with this, right? I can be like, dude, look around, Jade. You eat more healthy than the, than the average American, yet you're dealing with these, some of these metabolic consequences. By the way, you don't look that fat, but your body on blood labs is definitely, you know, um, not as healthy as it could be. Now I have two ways to go that I can blame, I can complain, I can compare, or I could just simply be, these are the unique circumstances that you've been given. And these are the unique lessons. There's got to be unique lessons within those circumstances that you can bring to bear. And that's a very different way of looking at life. So that way, illness, 
loss. Because here's the thing we know, Paul. I know this about you. You know it about me. You're going to die. I'm going to die. You're going to get sick. I'm going to get sick. You're going you're gonna to lose loved ones. I'm going to lose loved ones. You're going to have uh, all kinds of stuff that happens to you. I'm going to have all kinds of stuff that happens to me. The degree to which we can see those experiences as growth enhancing is the degree to which that we will live you know, more happily fulfilled lives. And yes, one thing that we could be sure of is that your life is going to suck in a lot of ways and so is mine and your life is going to be wonderful in a lot of ways and so is mine. And we just need to own that and just go, no matter what happens, I will make, you know, what's the other cliche statement that I love is I'll make you know, lemonade out of lemons. I can do that. That's the one human thing that we have, perhaps above all other animals, that we can take the shitty and create magic from it. Yeah. And that, to me, is our job. Yeah. Uh, that's so, so beautifully and powerfully said. It, the, yeah, I love that. The uh, other question that I had around the four human jobs is in the coaching that you've seen, is there one area that's easier to get some momentum in? And then is there one that allows it to bleed into others or does each kind of pillar have its own set of stories and roots that you have to go and identify individually? Yeah. It, it's, it's really interesting because there's one that really is a trap and it's the, it's the personal relationship one. That particular one is completely tough for everyone because we we think very wrongly it's the jerry Maguire syndrome it, it, that that movie for those of you who haven't seen it is a, it's a, a love story and at the end of this he basically comes rushing into the room jerry Maguire, to run into his wife and he says you know they're they're estranged and they're getting ready to get separated and he goes you complete me and she melts and they hug and it's just like okay this is my person right to me it's that mindset that we actually think that if we find the right people, the right spouse, the right family members, the right friends, the right mentor, that they will complete us and everything will get better from there. And that to me is a trap because we will easily fall prey to just trying to do that one job. Our whole life becomes centered around meeting our next romantic partner or being seen as the smartest person in the room or being the person who's the most helpful or whatever. And then we neglect and we see people like this all the time. Do we yeah. not the mom who does everything for everyone else yet who has uh, is completely out of shape and sick and not taking care of herself and has no direction or purpose outside of her kids. The, the businessman who is trying to make so much money to appear good to society right so it's not he's not doing his financial job in and of itself to make the world and himself a better place he's doing it to show off for for the personal relationship job so that's the one that i think people can get in big trouble with and the one that they want to center on all of the time the that's the first thing i'll say the other thing is that what people will oftentimes do is they tend to, it's like if you and I went into the gym together and I was like, dude, what do you want to do today? And let's say you're a CrossFitter and I'm not, right? You're going to, and I'm a bodybuilder. You're going to go, dude, let's do a CrossFit workout. And I'm going to go, ooh, I want to do a bodybuilding workout. You want to <laughs> do what you're good at. I want to do what I'm good at. Very, li no one wants to do something they're not good at because we know we're going to get our ass beat. So yeah. in these jobs, we go, well, I'm good at finance. I'll just continually focus on that. And then our relationships falls apart and our health and fitness falls apart and our purpose and meaning falls apart. And so these are the mistakes people make. And so what we have to do is once we become aware of these four jobs, step one is to be like, all right, am I making the first mistake, which I've got all my eggs in the personal relationship basket, and that's all I care about. My whole world revolves around that. I'm treating it as it's my only job. Or am I making a second mistake where I have a particular strength? Maybe I was born into money, so I learned about money, and I just focus on making more money. Or maybe I'm super fit and was an athlete growing up, and so I continue focusing on being an athlete, let all the other stuff go. Once you recognize where you are, or maybe the third thing, where it's like I'm not aware of these jobs in general, and most people aren't, and now I'm gonna rank them one to 10 on each of them, see how well I'm doing, yeah. right? And go, what am I doing one to 10 on finance? 10 being good, one being not. What am I doing one to 10 on personal relations? What are I doing one to 10 on health and fitness? What am I doing one to 10 purpose and meaning? 
And that immediately tells us where we need to focus our attention. Yeah. Do you find that there's one that's the, for the easiest to get going? Like someone might be, you can't change your relationships or your environment like that, but it's like you can start going to the gym or you can in, uh, establish some sort of financial strategy. Yeah. Believe it or not, the one that I think is the easiest one to start and the one where most people can start, it's like, it's, it's, it's becoming a little cliche now. It's like that whole thing, start with why. There's a lot of books written about that, usually yeah. they're business books. And it basically says, look, you need to define why you're here, right? And most people go, well, I, I, how am I going to find that? No, you don't. You just decide. I'm going to decide. You decided I'm going to do a podcast and I'm going to make a difference there. And we'll see. We'll figure it out as we go. Yeah. I think that's the first one that most people need to sort of do. And, and that one's an easy one from the standpoint, it's like, just decide. And then you can go, and the, here's why, the other three will flow out of that. If I choose to be teacher, right? Then it really sets up, you know, making money tells me how well I'm teaching. It becomes a feedback system for that. It also gives me longevity and the ability to teach. If I can't make money at it, I won't be able to teach. I won't right. be able to do my purpose. So it's, I tie the two together. Health mm. and fitness. If I don't have the energy and look the part, I can't teach health and fitness, right? And personal relationships. If I know that I want to be a teacher, especially in the realm of health and fitness, then I can go meet guys like Paul and our friend Cody and other people who I can learn from and interact with. So to me, that particular job helps you organize the other three jobs. I think that's the best place to start. The, the interesting thing about that, though, is even though you can start with that job, it will be the last to emerge. In other mm -hmm. words, you have to kind of be it until you see it. You have to act the teacher part. You have to be it clearly when no one's watching and when, when you're not getting any money coming in or any results. You have to be it, and then it starts to manifest. So you decide. You go do these other three jobs well, and then this starts to emerge from there. Does that make sense? Yeah, I love how that cycle works. and. For you and for other people, the finding the why I think is really hard because you have what your parents say your why should be, what society says your why should be. As a kid, you have your why, and that, but that's before everything else kind of lands on you and shit hits the fan. Yeah. How do you help people find the why? Like, what are actionable steps that you can do to be like, okay, I've narrowed it down from a million things to do to four. Which one yeah. feels the best with my soul? Yeah, well, you know, we talked about a little bit passions. People say follow your passion. Only follow your passion though, as long, if you can find a groove, right? So you find your why by saying, what do I love to do? What makes me feel good, right? Mm -hmm. That's the first part. The second part, though, is what makes a difference? What will help me grow? So it makes a difference to me and to humanity. What will help me grow? What do I love to do? And what will make a difference for humanity? What will I be proud to do? So to me, I answer those three questions. What do I love to do? What will grow me? And what will make me proud to, to have, have done it? Your why lies in there. And so if you're still confused about it, you can chase passions. It's like my, I have a, uh, my, uh, my nephew's 21, just started college. And he's asking me the same question. I said, dude, try a lot of stuff on, right? But be very careful of falling in lust with passions. Yeah. You don't want to fall in lust with passions. Lust is fleeting. What you want to do is you want to fall in love with a passion. The passion that you fall in love with doesn't mean that's the thing. It just means your purpose lies within that. For example, I fell in love with football. Football brought me to the point where I fell in love with fitness. Fitness brought me to the point where I fell, fell in love with biochemistry. Right around that time, I started to see, wow, I have some unique signature strengths. I can explain this stuff a little bit better than other people can. That, all of a sudden, right around that time, my purpose started to materialize. I loved football. I followed it. It brought me to my love of fitness. I followed it. It brought me to my love of so nutrition. Cool. I followed it. And right there, I started to be like, ooh, wait a second. Maybe I'm not meant to be a doctor. Maybe I'm not meant to be a healer. I could have chosen that path. I think I most am suited to teacher. Once I, I focused on that, it materialized for me. And a couple things materialized. Teacher popped up. Healer popped up. Right? Other, you know, a couple bit entrepreneur popped up. And then I was like, no, teacher. That's what, that's where I want. That's where I want the end of my life to go. I taught. I was a teacher. That's my thing. So now all of a sudden, now it makes sense to a lot of people when they hear that, oh, I can see why you don't really see a whole lot of patients anymore, right? You, because you 
have decided your purpose is the teacher. And I got there through following my passions. And I asked those three questions. What do I love to do? What, where am I going to grow? Because a teacher always has to be a student. And I'm a big time student. Yeah. And what's going to make the biggest difference? What am I uniquely suited to do? I'm a good, I'm a good physician. I'm not my grandfather. And I'm not my brother. They're better healers than me. What I'm very good at, though, better than them, is I'm a great teacher. And that's how it, is ha it happens. And I think we each have to walk that path. But if you're not aware of it and you never hear anyone have these discussions like we're having, it seems amorphous. It seems yeah. like it's just it falls on you. It actually doesn't fall on you. Right now, everyone listening has a glimpse of this. They, they get it immediately when I say that. They're just like, oh, I can see, but I do. But there is that leap part that has to happen. There's that part where you're like, I'm going to be teacher. And once you say, that's my purpose now, there's a leap that has to happen. And this is another cliche statement that I don't agree with, which is leap in the net will appear. No, typically it <laughs> won't appear. You leap and weave the net as you fall, right? So you have to understand that once you make that leap, it's not just going to be all hunky dory and you get to walk off into the, the sunset. Shit's going to get real, real fast. And life's going to be like, okay, Paul, you want that? Okay, Jay, that's, you say you want that? Let's see how bad you really want it because we're going to, we're going to, it's not going to be that easy. You're going to have to earn it. Yeah. And that's where the leap happens. That's part of the earning process. And then people go, why leap? How come it doesn't work out? That's not fair because that's not how life works. You can leap and then you have to weave the net as well. And guess what? And here's the part that sucks, dude. This is the part that sucks. I always imagine American Idol, someone getting up on stage and singing and they can't sing worth a damn. So they, le they leaped, they made the leap, they tried to weave it as they fell, and they crashed and burned. And I actually go, good, life is great feedback. So yeah. if you missed it, and you're not being successful at it, then yes, then there's maybe something else out there to do. And here's the pivot, actually. I'll tell you this one story, and hopefully everyone doesn't, isn't getting bored with this. But I, I had a client who um, wanted to be a singer really badly, which is why I talked about American Idol. And what ended up happening was, they weren't really a great singer. That was their purpose. But what they realized in the crash and burn is that, oh, same as me. I might not be the best singer, but I can, I can see and hear voices better than anyone. And I can uh -huh. coach people on how to adjust their voice. And I'm really good at that. So maybe I won the best singer, but I'm still in music. Music is still my purpose. It's just slightly different. And a lot of people are afraid to pivot. Right. But what if that failure is the very thing that you needed to have to help you see the other angle? And yeah. that's often how life works. Yeah. I love that. I love how for you, you're essentially just refining. You're going from gold ore all the way down to like, this is the little nugget of what I do. And to that, that story of the, the American idol, I think the biggest one is just awareness and if you don't have awareness of whether or not you have the ability to weave the net as you fall the ground will give you that feedback but in the if you want to do that you need to get that feedback before you need to and it's uncomfortable because you do have to ask friends like hey like do i suck it at managing people or you have to um, you know go and do the work to to get the certification so that you do have the skill sets required to again build that net so i want to get into the metabolism piece because yeah, yeah. that's the thing that you're most known for and that's that little gold nugget i think the first question that i always have around the metabolism is like what is it it when i think of it i think of it as a, a computer processor and it's either processing a lot of information or it's not yeah I, I think a computer processor is a great way to think of the metabolism i i describe it as a stress barometer and the reason I describe it that way is because if you think about what the metabolism actually is, it's a mechanism for us to sense what is going on in the outside world and translate that information to the inside world so that we can respond, adapt, and survive. So in other words, our eyes, our ears, our nose, our, our sense of temperature, our touch are all essentially looking out there and saying, is it safe? Do I have enough resources? What are the resources available to me? What are the danger signals out there? And then, hey, cells inside my body, here's what I need you to do to respond to that. So all the metabolism is, is that translation that happens, right? So in your analogy, the, the metabolism as a computer program, right, or as a computer, 
Well, your eyes are, you know, and ears and all that kind of stuff are the keyboard, the mouse, the disc drive where you're putting in information. Yeah. And then the hormonal system in the computer is uh, the software program, right? The software program that you're running. So there's a stress software program. There's a digest software program. There's a reproduce software program. There's a sleep software program, right? So the metabolism is simply this thing that says, I want to get you back to balance so that you can survive and reproduce. That's essentially what it is. And it uses software hormones to translate what's going on in the outside world to the inside cells. That's why we talk an awful lot about when we talk about metabolism, we talk an awful lot about energy, calories, and hormones, the software program. And those are the two things, by the way, that we all need to be aware of. Most people are getting this wrong because they go, well, it's just a calorie thing. Well, that's part of it, but it's also the software program thing. So it's both, right? It's the energy needs and it's the sensing and sort of ability to respond to those energy needs. So I always say there's two things sort of required for sustained weight loss, or a better term is fat loss, right? And that is a energy deficit. We need less energy sort of coming in so we can use the stored energy on our body. But we also need the software program to send the signal, hey, it's safe to burn this fat. And or it, if, if it's not safe, it says, hold on to it because it might be winter outside and we might need these, these uh, storage, which it's really interesting, right? Because take a woman, for example, women always go, well, why is it harder to learn, lose fat at certain parts of my menstrual cycle? And why don't I lose fat when I'm breastfeeding per se? Because the metabolism goes in the first instance, if it's the second part of your menstrual cycle, the metabolism goes, hey, we might have a baby coming. Yeah. We better make sure we become a little bit more insulin resistant to make sure this fuel reserves are there for potential baby. Likewise, we're still breastfeeding. We're not going to release this fat right now because we need to have extra energy on our body for this potential baby if food runs out. And once you understand that, those are the reason I bring those two questions up because those two questions have stumped everyone for so long. And then as soon as you hear it, as soon as you frame the metabolism correctly, you go, of course, that makes complete sense. Yeah. That, that, though, that gives you a great idea of the metabolism. And for men, right, here's another example for men, just to not leave men out of it. But for men, think about this. For men, if you get too fat, what happens to libido and erections? They don't perform that well. And if you get too lean, by the way, you're going to have the same thing. That's why we got a lot of these bodybuilders, 4% body fat and this and that, can't get an erection. They have great abs and everything else, but their libido shot. They can't get an erection. It's the same kind of thing. And so our bodies are actually giving us feedback all the time about how our metabolism is functioning. Two of the most important have to do with reproduction and libido. Yeah. Obviously, that's the whole point of why our physiology deems it necessary to even be walking around. And so that is how to look at it. Now, there's other biofeedback signals. There's libido. There's menses. There's energy, there's cravings, there's hunger, there's exercise performance, exercise recovery. There's a lot of different things we can tap into to understand how the metabolism is functioning. And what happens is most people are missing this because you and I know, Paul, that what do most people do? They just go, am I losing weight or not? You know, hopefully they're a little more savvy and go, am I losing fat or not? But most yeah. people are just, am I losing weight or not? Then my metabolism is either healthy or not. They're not realizing that uh, your metabolism is talking to you. It's talking to you on on, you know, your ability to go to the bathroom, you know, are you constipated? Do you have loose stools and diarrhea? That's telling you something. You got joint pains and stuff like that. That's telling you something. You got migraines. That's telling you something. You have no energy. You got sleep apnea. All that's telling you something. And what it's telling you normally is the reason why you're not able to free up your fat stores. So I think that's a, a, a long-winded way of describing the, the, the infrastructure and the way the metabolism works. Very simply, it is a stress barometer. It measures what's going out on in the outside world, and then it creates changes inside to help adapt. And we can get a sense of what it's doing by paying attention to all these different feedback uh, systems that we can sense, if that makes sense. Yeah, definitely. And I think the thing that people miss the most is that it's trying to keep you alive. The metabolism doesn't have 
you know, the cover of Shape magazine in mind when it's like, all right, let's <laughs> make sure that Sally's feeling really good about themselves. It's like, all right, can we use this fuel? Like, is this fuel available in case X happens that's going to affect our ability to survive, reproduce? Yeah, I, I love that, man, because one of the things, and this, this is a difference between men and women oftentimes too, because women are the gender of, uh, you know, reproduction. They're the ones that have to, gender of childbearing, their system is a little bit different than the male system. And so women getting too lean is the, the metabolism uses a governor, you know, like a governor that you put on a, a school bus to keep yeah. it from 80, keeps it only at 60. Oftentimes the female governor is a little bit more powerful than the male governor. What I mean by that is that you can have some women just fine. Their governor is fine because we're all individual and they can get to under 20% body fat. But right around that 20% mark for many women is the point. And by the way, our society says to your point that, oh, you should be as a woman, you know, 15% body fat or something. That's extremely lean for a woman. That's like elite athlete status females. Right around the 20% mark, high teens, low 20s, it's going to depend on the individual. That's when a female's metabolism can start registering and start saying, I'm a little bit too lean to want to reproduce. They, she can start having libido issues at that point, and she can start having menstrual-related issues at that point, or she can start having the metabolism start to constrain itself and put a governor on. Of course, your point is, and I love that point, it's a point I make a lot as well, is that your metabolism does not give a damn about your vanity concerns or your timetables or your, you know, your considerations around convenience. It literally is saying, I don't like you this lean. I'm going to hold on to my fat and I'm going to make you crave a bunch more too. And that's the reality of what we're working with. Once you understand that, it starts to become a little bit easier. For example, we'll start doing some of the advanced tools that, you know, you and I use, which would be stuff like, okay, if we know the metabolism is going to do that and we want to trick it, then we certainly won't try to do this for eight weeks. We'll go one week, two weeks of putting it in a little bit of stress situation. Then we'll come back to something that's a little easier for it to deal with. So it doesn't overreact, right? So once you start to understand this stuff, you start understanding why intermittent energy restrictive diets, you know, being restricted for time and then not. And, you know, um, you know, some of the tools and techniques that people like you and I use become effective because we actually understand how the metabolism works. It's, it's, it's an interesting thing, man, that I think everyone needs to understand. I just posted this on my Instagram feed, but I think we have three levels of sort of hormonal or metabolism understanding. Level 1.0 is an energy first thing. It's like calories are all that matters. The, this is sort of the basic, uh, you know, elementary version. The next stage up is sort of like quality matters, food matters, right? And this is where we'll just eat the particular diet or eat organic or this, this, and this. It's a little bit better, but it's still pretty naive approach. The level 3.0, where we all should be, is that metabolism matters, that the metabolism is what's telling us. And it takes into account both quantity and quality, plus a whole lot more. And so if you're just one of these people who's focusing on energy only, or food quality only, or hormones only, you're missing the bigger picture. Yeah. So what are, are you... Are you getting at what you call heck out of check or different biofeedback signs or stressors? Or for me, like I'm really big on having avenues of mental health, whether that's a meditation, a walk, floating, just yeah. so that, you know, you can manage those hormonal responses maybe a little bit better or when you get that external stressor. Yeah. Yeah, that's exactly what I'm talking about. As a matter of fact, um, when we talk about, I talk about uh, different biofeedback systems that we already talked about. Um, sleep, hunger, mood, energy, cravings. They're the most important ones. And oftentimes with my clients, I, I use a funny little term called SHMEC, S-H-M-E-C, sleep, hunger, mood, energy, and cravings. It's funny, Schmeck, if your SHMEC is in check, your metabolism is balanced. If your SHMEC is out of check, then you know your metabolism is out of balance. What's funny about this is research actually shows if I make a rhyme, if I teach you to something in a rhyme, you think it, you remember it more and you actually find it more credible. So. Yeah. Funny thing, Schmeck and check, you won't forget. But also don't forget that Schmeck is just a catch-all phrase for all biofeedback. So Schmeck is sleep, hunger, mood, energy, and cravings. Heck is hunger, energy, cravings. These are the most important ones. Our goal should be get Schmeck, heck, in check, under control. Then when it's under control, now you can push on your metabolism. Now you can 
push the food quality and or quantity, whichever it is your individual preferences about how to get the results you want. Now you're in a place of strength. Now your metabolism can handle that. What most people do is they just go, oh, I'm just going to cut all carbs. I'm just going to cut calories down and I'm just going to willpower it out. That does not work. You'll never win a battle of wills against your physiology, period. You just won't, right? You won't do that. And actually, I'm going to let these dogs out while we're chatting real quick. Yeah. For all of you listening, I'm babysitting my sister's dog. <laughs> absolutely driving me crazy. Right. I love it. Go on, go on, go on. But, you know, so for me, I look at it like metabolism has to be looked at that way. Once you start to understand metabolism um, from that perspective, you're not as confused anymore. You know what I mean? Yeah. Well, and so many people are, and I've done this too in the past where it's like, oh, my metabolism's kind of slow right now, or my metabolism's fast. But you talk a lot about having a flexible metabolism. Can you go a little bit into detail about why having a fast metabolism isn't necessarily what you want? Yeah, you definitely do not want a fast metabolism because anytime you speed up the metabolism, you also speed up hunger. We see this over and over again. This is the reason why if you put people in cold tanks, right? Remember all the whole stuff about cryotherapies and this and that, and that stuff will help you burn fat. And the reason they thought that that would happen is because it does in the short term. It speeds up metabolism and it also speeds up fat burning. The problem is, though, the metabolism is adaptive and reactive. And so what it does is, okay, so you sped up metabolism. Now I'm going to speed up hunger. And what it, what's interesting, what happens is about 25% of people who have a sped up metabolism, only about 25% don't overcompensate with food. About 50% compensate enough to get back to balance. But here's the really shitty part. 25% actually overcompensate. Actually, there was a really interesting study on menopausal women. They basically took menopausal women. They gave them an aerobic exercise program, if my memory serves me correctly. I posted this on my Instagram feed, this study, if anyone wants to go find it. But it was 40 minutes of aerobic exercise in a group of uh, menopausal women with no change in diet. And they gave enough of aerobic exercise to create a 30%, I believe, or 20% calorie deficit, right, for the week. And then they sat back and looked. Now, if it's just an, a 1.0 thinking, right, nutrition 1.0 or, or metabolism 1.0 thinking, they should have lost weight, except they didn't. 25% of them did. 50% of them, 5-0, actually remained exactly the same weight. 25% of them actually gained weight, which means 25% of these women actually would have been better off not exercising at all, not trying to speed up their metabolism because what happened is they overcompensated with food. And this is pretty much par for the course across the board whenever we try to do things like speed up the metabolism. This includes stuff like taking, you know, um, uh, you know fat burners and things like that or, um, you know, coffee, you know, uh, caffeine and stuff like that. Short term, it will cause hunger suppression. If you wait too long, many people will actually see an increased hunger as a result of that. Uh, cryotherapies, um, uh, exercise, all of these kinds of things, right? Especially exercise that doesn't really give you as much of an afterburn, like weight training would be um, better to do because not only are you burning calories during the weight training session, but then you have to burn calories to recover from that, which you'll do a little bit with cardio, just not as much, but then you have to do much more to repair the, the muscle damage that was done. Again, cardio will do some of that, but typically not much. And then adaptation energy use, right? To get faster and stronger. So typically when you do cardio, you're speeding up the metabolism. When you stop doing the cardio, you stop the burn. Typically there's very little afterburn. But when you do weight training based stuff, you're also going to speed up the metabolism, but that metabolism is going to be sped up for much longer so that the extra energy compensation that you might have, if you're one of the 25% who will overeat as a result of that, a lot of that energy will be used up in the repair, recovery and adaptation process. And even if you do go over your caloric allotments at that point, you're far more likely to put on muscle versus fat in that scenario, which is why a lot of people like you and me will say we should be doing weight training instead. So no, you don't want 
a fast metabolism per se. What you want is a flexible metabolism. That's a little bit different. The flexible metabolism essentially means that if I give my body carbohydrate, it can use it. It uses the energy. It knows what to do with it. If I give my body fat, it knows what to do with it. If my body's under stress and didn't get any food at all, it knows what to do with it. It can jump into ketosis quickly and come out of ketosis quickly. It can jump into helping us perform well in a workout and helping us sleep well too. We want to uh, you know, create this flexible metabolism, which brings me to one of the most important points about a flexible metabolism. Imagine Paul and I, right? Imagine you and I, man, taking a client who's never done anything, right? They're overweight. Let's say, let's say they're my age, 45. They've never worked out before. Uh, let's say they're a friend of mine and yours. And they're like, we want, I want to come to the gym with you. I want to train with you guys. And they try to do exactly what you and I did. We would probably end up hurting them. And if we didn't hurt them, we probably would, if they got through it, you know, maybe 10% will get through it and in a year look like us. Yeah. But most people are either going to get hurt or overeat or just quit because it's too hard. That's like taking an elite athlete, skipping spring training and throwing them into the Super Bowl. It just doesn't work like that. The best thing we can do as coaches and the best thing clients can do, those of you who are just enthusiasts who are listening to this, is to ease into it. This is why I have a concept I call metabolic prehab, which is really about if I'm going to start you from scratch, I'm not going to take you from a couch potato pizza eater, right, to a crossfitting paleo man or girl. That is going to be faster than anything. Yeah, it'll speed up metabolism. It's going to make you extra hungry. You're probably going to get injured you're not going to get results from that. However, if I start you on a walking program with a, a few two to three, you know, light resistance training programs, and then slowly move you into over a three month period into CrossFit paleo approach, you're going to be far more likely to deal with that. So metabolic flexibility essentially says that most people, if you imagine a rubber band, most people have a very frozen, rigid rubber band. If you try to stretch that out real quick, it snaps. Mm. Right. And that's why we see all these people in the spring running around like squirrels trying to lose weight because they they're like, oh, it's getting warm out. Maybe I'll try to lose weight this year. Three days go by. You don't see anyone out on the road running anymore because they've all hurt themselves or they've eaten themselves into oblivion. The people who you'll see there are the people who start out walking and start out more gently in this sort of more prehab type approach. Yeah, that's how we need to be thinking about it. And that is owing to the fact that no, don't try to speed up your metabolism. Make your metabolism more flexible. Once you understand that, you immediately stop trying to do extremes because you know that an extreme in one direction will result in an extreme in the other direction. In other words, extreme exercise leads to extreme hunger. Most people don't realize their over-exercise habit is related to their over-cheesecake habit, right? Mm -hmm. That that's just the way it works. Instead, we want to say, okay, we're going to be a little bit more flexible with this um, and be a little bit more smarter in our approach. Yeah, totally. To that point, it sounds like the metabolism has, like it's always trying to keep you in equilibrium. It doesn't want you to overextend and, and become too flexible too fast. You have to gently go into it. Is there any validity to the statement that the metabolism almost has an identity to where it, it combines with like either different memories you've had in the past to where it's like, all right, this is what your body is set at. Mm -hmm. And you can go left to right based off where you're at, but it's really hard. The same way it is for someone to change their identity from average to a, a greatness. Are you getting where I'm kind of getting yeah. at? Yeah. And you're, you're kind of talking in the research, there's a difference between set point and settling point in a sense. So yeah. set point essentially says, you know, uh, and there's a lot of, uh, this is kind of a theory. We don't necessarily know how true it is, but there's a lot to be said for the fact that the metabolism can move in a particular direction, but it likes to be set at a particular point. For example, for a long time, I'm 5'10". I tend to be a guy who's sort of um, muscle fat. It's a nice way of saying it. I put on muscle easily. I gain fat easily. For a long time, my set point was I'm 5'10". It was 240. And I used to try to go to extremes. And what I was happening is then my set point went to 242. Then it went to 245. I was slowly pushing that set point up and up and up, and it always wanted to kind of come back. I couldn't get below 240. That's what I think you're sort of talking about, this yeah. idea that the metabolism likes to come back to where it was. Settling point essentially says there's more of a range that it can move in, right? So it can move in 
a particular range and it can kind of do this as you're kind of moving that uh, if you're if you're not if you're just listening to this what I'm doing with my hands is just moving them apart like a rubber band this flexibility of a rubber band slowly but surely the rubber band can become more flexible you can pull it more further apart and it also starts to trickle downwards this is more of the settling point versus set point and the way you do that is exactly the way that the same way you increase your set point by doing extremes and then convincing your body that it needs to worry about starvation so it starts to increase hunger and cravings store put a governor on your metabolism and store more fat the way you actually move that set point down is to do the reverse of that and a lot of people hate this man but this essentially means i'm going to let myself be a little bit fat for a little bit of time and then i'm going to do it again this is the difference between overcoming a set point what we do is when i was 245 at my highest what I started to do is I was like, all right, I'm gonna push myself down to 240. Then I'm gonna let myself come back up to 242. And I'm gonna hold right there, right? And then I'm gonna go down to 237. Then I'm gonna let myself come back to 240, right? Then I'm gonna let myself, and by the way, this is months. So when I say let myself come down, I'm talking about from January, February, March, I went from 245 to 235, let's say. And then I let myself come back to 240 over the next several months. Then I did it again. Now I'm gonna go from 235 to 225 and let myself come back to 230, right? Now here's what happened in practice. I was able to get my set point down. Now my set point is 230. Guess why though? Because at 230, at this point, remember my metabolism doesn't care about my convenience level. I like a degree of pasta and wine. I'm Italian. I like yeah. these things. So I have found that I am not as comfortable as I want to be once I start trying to get down past 225, which is where my weight typically sits. My high now is 230. My weight is right around 225. I would look much better to myself and probably feel better too and have, I snore and stuff like that. So I'd probably, if I could get down to 210, right, I'd probably be better off at 210. But am I willing to do sort of the extremes that it would take to get there? Most people, one, don't want to do the extremes. I don't blame them, but then don't blame your metabolism either because it's just doing what it's doing. And number two, most people don't want to have that settling point backwards. If you really want to make this work for yourself, there's a time that you're going to be a little bit fat. And, you know, so I have times during the year where I am much fatter than I am at other times. And those fat times are what allows me to get to leaner times. And I think that is the approach that most people simply don't understand. But once you understand everything that Paul and I have been talking about, you get this very clearly. That's understanding flexible metabolism, not fast metabolism. That's understanding set point versus settling point. That's understanding freeing the metabolism from thinking it's going to be in starvation mode and it has to overreact to stress. It's a very smart, logical approach but it doesn't always jive with our convenience and our, our thing. Cause what we want is we like, I'm, I'm 300 pounds. I want to be 200 pounds by the next year. And I want to just eat less and exercise more to get there. And guess what? You might do that. We see that in, you know, with the biggest loser, we saw that, right? We can definitely force you to get all that weight off you, but the degree to which you go to that extreme is the degree to which that rubber band will boomerang back. Yeah. And that's why all the biggest losers became the biggest gainers because they did it wrong. Yeah. So when, what that, when that's happening, you're essentially setting that limbo bar lower and lower. And the only way to get underneath it is to cut calories, but then you finally come back to eating regular and it snaps you back, but your limbo bar is at 1200 and there's no way that you can continue to do that. I love that analogy, man. That's a good one. Yes. The limbo. I, I love the limbo sort of a visual thing. And, exactly so, how it works. and so that's where, you know, in order to when you're talking about that, just so I'm understanding clearly and for other people, you have to come back to that set point to be like, all right, like we don't actually have to get under this limbo ball. We're going to reset it so that it's easier to get under, easier to get under. And then like, what's your plan after that diet? Yeah. And you know, another way to think about it too, is like in the gym, right? We have loading times and deloading times. If you're yeah. really smart with your, 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 um, your sort of progressions in, um, and your periodization in working out, you don't go heavy all the time. That would be nuts. You know, it's like you, you have lighter periods of time. You cycle through lighter periods of time. So, for example, I might be doing like one of my go-to workouts is a bench press, 
225, deadlift 225, and a calorie row for, you know, it's 10, 10, 10, 9, 9, 9, 10 all the way down to one. So you do bench press 10 times, deadlift 10 times, 10 calorie rows. And you do the bench press nine times, deadlift nine times, you know, calorie row nine, all the way down to one. Same weight stays the same. Now that's a heavy weight. It's my body weight. It's 225. That's 55 reps, right? If I tried to do that every time I went in the gym, my body wouldn't like that so much. So I do that same workout on occasion where it's much lighter and I go much faster. And maybe I add on push-ups in between. So now the bench press becomes 135. The deadlift becomes 135, right? And I go harder and longer maybe on the calories, uh, the calorie row. Uh, or maybe I just leave the workout exactly the same. And what a lot of people don't like is they don't like the idea that this is how this works. Why are we so dense as humans? We cannot push the metabolism or the body full speed ahead all of the time. It's it's an asinine approach, but everyone does it. And we know that it doesn't work, yeah. right? But we keep trying to do it. Yeah. <laughs> I think that's a mic drop moment right there. <laughs> that's, uh, it's, it's, it's the idea of this, the stock market. It's not just going to go straight down or straight up. You got to allow for the ups and downs. Mm -hmm. And kind of coming back full circle to what we talked about, it's that you know, the yang to suffering and amazing waves and catching you know breaks and getting knocked back down but i think the the magic is in the getting the back getting back out into the into the ocean i, I love that you brought it full circle because i do think it is i mean literally when you talk about self-development and you talk about um, all those jobs a lot of it is about getting into flow with it and realizing that the the down the the setbacks are um some of the best learning opportunities but, uh, and this is another, I, I always like making distinctions. Here's another distinction I don't like. I don't like the whole thing rise to the occasion. That's true to a degree. But in this approach, we're talking about let's create the occasion, right? Let's create occasions where we take steps back. Let's create occasions where we challenge ourselves. Let's create occasions where we get out of our comfort zone. Let's not wait, wait to rise to the occasion. Because if we create the occasion, we're actually training for when things really do go wrong. And, you know, rather than waiting for it, we can build it in. And this is what the whole idea, you know, maybe this is a new term for many of you listening, I don't know, but the whole idea of periodization within nutrition and within uh, fitness, also within life. Like, that's how we have to do. It's, it's a flow type approach, right? It's yeah. like Bruce Lee has a famous, you know, sort of thing that he says, be like water, my friend. And actually, it comes from the Tao Te Ching. So he was the first one to kind of bring that to the Western world. It says, water is really interesting because water, you put it in a teacup, it becomes the teacup. You put it in a bowl, it becomes the bowl. You put it on the floor, it travels down the, least, the path of least resistance. You don't say see water seeking out a crack and then staying there and whining about it. It goes, oh, here's a crack here. Okay, fine, there's I'm an obstacle there. I will start heading this way, right? Yeah. And this, this is, so he, he says, so be like water, it can flow. It can crash, it can adapt, it can wait, it can be patient, right? It, and that's how we sort of need to be. Instead, we go, this isn't working. Why is it not working? It would be like us walking down a mountain pass, a big boulder falls in front of us, and we sit in front of the boulder screaming and yelling up at the mountain, why'd you do this to me? I can't stand this, it's all your fault. When meanwhile, it's like any normal person would be like, okay, there's a boulder here. I can either climb over it, I can go around it, I can get something to move it. Right. And, and I wouldn't just sit there and complain about it. Yeah. Yeah, totally. And one last point before we wrap this up is just when you're periodizing things, there has to be a time for a recovery and there's a season for everything. So by all means go hard, but you also got to recover hard. You got to rest hard. You got to spend time with family hard. You got to save hard. I don't know. Whatever the, the four, yeah. four jobs you have, you got to, you got to on the other end of the spectrum, just as hard. I love it, man. Cool. Uh, Jade, thank you so much for coming on and spending time talking with me. And this is the longest podcast I've done. And I looked at the time and I was like, oh, wow, this is, <laughs> this is so much knowledge, so much wisdom. So much. I pro I, I no, no, it's fantastic. I, I call them uh, wisdom hurricanes where someone will just be walking down the street listening to this. And it's just like, Phew, and they're like, wow, <laughs> what did I just listen to? So that happened uh, to me several times. Uh, how can people find you on social media? I know you got several books out. Yeah. Uh, your website, share all those different um, locations. 
Yeah, if you if you want to check out some of some of my books, just go on Amazon, search Jade Tita. You'll see some of my personal development books and some of my health and fitness books. But the best place to get me is at Jade Tita on Instagram. DM me there. I do my best to answer questions. I have an assistant that helps me get to some of those questions. But definitely get in touch with me there and follow me there. And I have a website, jadetita.com. And brother, I really appreciate you having me here, man. Totally honored that you would want me and appreciate your work as well. Yeah, cool. Thank you so much. Uh, hopefully those dogs are doing all right outside. <laughs> <laughs> Catch you another time. Take it easy. You too, man.